Hello everybody, welcome back to Best Books Ever. I'm Tyler, and today we are continuing Tress of the Emerald Sea by Brandon Sanderson. We are doing parts three and four. That includes chapters 13 through 34. Uh, yeah, much bigger part this time. Last time, like we said, was mostly just an introduction to like the characters, the world, the spores, all that stuff. Even, uh, like, uh, you know, honestly, with the spores, we didn't really learn that much last time. Um, it was a lot more of just like, oh, they're scary and stuff. But this time, get a lot more, not only into the spores that we knew, like the vine ones, but also different types. And most of them we haven't even seen. Um, but that's like small stuff compared to how this book or how this, you know, how these chapters end and where we're going to for this last leg of the book. Um, because it ends with Tress realizing, or at least mostly inferring, but it all makes sense to what she feels Crow is trying to do, is that Crow is going to trade her Tress to the dragon um, I don't know how to pronounce it. It's like Sisis or like Shisis, uh, because of the X, whatever, the dragon. Because they th think, hypothesize, there's evidence, but it's like, eh, is the evidence really, really there that the dragon can cure any ailment, any disease, any whatever you want to call it, any sickness, which includes crows condition i don't really know that her, her you know her thing counts as an ailment it's more so like something like a parasite is using her as a host but it seems like this is her best shot now there's a lot of stuff going on there right obviously we have the uh you know the dread that tress is gonna have to be a servant to the dragon forever it seems um you know, because she's like, quote unquote, not afraid of spores, even though she is. Um, it is funny the way that like Hoyd tells this story. Because it is like, oh, Tress isn't like other heroes. You know, she isn't the super brave person. She's not heroic. She's not, you know, always going into danger. You know, she does actually sit down and think about things instead of just rushing into her first conclusion, which usually isn't correct. But then you look at stuff like this, and especially how uh, Soleil in particular is pinning her as a king's mask. And it's like, I don't know, if you look at a lot of stuff that Tress has done recently, um, you kind of string it all together. It's like, eh, maybe, you know, you can kind of see how Tress is a hero. Or at least she has these very stereotypical heroic attributes. Um, even though she's really just trying to save Charlie. But, you know, but even then it's like... If it was, like, her family member, I feel like she could get away with being, like, I'm not a hero, like, it's family, you know. But it's Charlie, like, someone that you're pretty cool with that seems to like you, but it's, like, is it worth it? Like, this is something I've been thinking about a lot, like, as the chapters go on, and especially once we get here at the very end, when it's, like, okay, here's a crazy thing that you just figured out. Could be real. It could be fake. Dragon could could not be real. But I think especially with Ulam talking about it, it's like probably a real thing because Ulam is seemingly immortal. We'll get to Ulam in a moment. But it's like, man, you kind of you kind of just sit back for a second and think, is is Charlie worth this? Again, not not saying Charlie's a bad person. You know, I think Charlie is genuine. He seems very cool, and he seems to like Tress for Tress, um, for who she is. And vice versa. But it's like, man, is all this worth it? Like, is all the, you know, is this, is this really what we want to do? I'm so scared that, like, by the end of this book, you're going to see that Charlie's dead. Like, yeah, the sorceress literally killed him. <laughs> you know? Um, but yeah, I don't know. Getting back to the dragon stuff. Um, I don't know. I think maybe we'll save predictions for a little bit. Because uh, we're going to finish the book next week. 
Um, but it's like, it's crazy. Like dragons here seemingly exist. He's going to cure. Her. But like, you know, it, it, is it even that easy? And they still got to get there. And how does the sorcerers play into all this? So um, we'll get a little deeper into that at the very end. Um, with that, just, just another little thing with that. Um, it is across the Crimson Sea, very, very dangerous sea, along with the Midnight Sea, which is past that, which they technically don't have to get to for what um, Crow is trying to do. But again, somehow getting into predictions, you know, later, but like, how is, uh, you know, Tress is going to have to not get traded to the dragon and then also somehow get to the midnight sea like i don't know it's a very tall order uh what else do we have this whole like hoid stuff is very confusing to me um so hoid tells tress that she needs to bring hoid to her planet and then also look for the group of six stars now we know that hoid is He's cursed, right? So he can't really talk about his curse or anything surrounding it. Um, aside from other stuff as well, like he's sorcerers really just messed him up, <laughs> in in all the we in like in all the weirdest ways. Um, but there are little sparks and like little tiny, tiny, tiny little pads that he's able to take to sometimes give somewhat relevant information. And so if we break this down into two parts, the latter half. We've already seen, right? I mean, you know, unless what Tress did wasn't exactly what he was look, you know, what he was intending, but it seemed like it was, because it seemed like he was pretty happy with her getting those midnight spores. So it's like, yeah, it seems like the six stars correlating to the secret compartment under the bed in Weave's old room. That seems to be what he was trying to do. So you got the midnight spores. Um, now, even with that, it's like, I'm not sure if Hoyd was trying to direct her to that to then do what she did with them, which is use them to spy on the captain, get the information about what the captain's plan is. Crimson Sea, Dragon, we just talked about all that. Was that it, or was it just, hey, the Midnight Spores could help you? I don't know exactly how, but here's how you get to them. Um, that's, that's yet to be seen to see if she, you know, see if she uses them again. I, I hope she would. You know, because it seemed very, very useful. And it definitely seems like they were setting it up when, you know, she, I don't know if, did I have notes on when she used them? I do have a note on the midnight stuff. So let me just squeeze that in here uh, concurrently with what I'm talking about. Uh, Ulam tells her that midnight spores create midnight ether or essence, a bit of goo that imitates a nearby object or entity. Uh, very, very cool. It's like a shape-shifting thing, and apparently, I didn't realize that, uh, I don't know if Ulam said this when he was explaining this to her, um, but yeah, like, the, the user, I guess, or, you know, I guess the host, uh, can control the ether to an extent. We did see the, the Midnight stuff kind of fight against Tress at the end there, um, you know, not really wanting to do what she wanted to do, wanting to kind of uh, succumb to the instincts of the entity that it, uh, you know, that it was, uh, formed as, as a rat of like, why, why are we reading? I, you know, I love the one line where it was like, uh, words are splinters for the eyes. <laughs> I thought that was really funny. Um, but yeah, so that's again, just really, really cool. And I would hope that she would use it again. Maybe it would make sense for her to use it going forward maybe against a dragon or something i'm not saying that she could like form a dragon but you know i did think they were setting up for this time she got lucky and we'll see what happens next time she uses it because she got lucky with huck being there able to sever the bond and save her from seemingly dying you know she was all dried out like her arms were all messed up and you know there's like black goo coming out her mouth it's like oh man you almost, you, know, oof, you almost went too far. So, you know, I, you know, I do think that foreshadows her using it at least one more time. Um, you know, so. 
Uh, but then the, the, the first part of that breakdown, we got to the six stars, probably done that, right? There's probably not another instance of it all your six stars. The first thing is bring me to your planet. What does that mean? <laughs> what does that mean? Now, I could say it just rolls into what other advice he gave with like, find someone who speaks that can't speak or something like that which was leading to the familiar which was all closing in on using the midnight spores to be a familiar to spy so we could just wash our hands with this whole thing right now and just be like that's what it was that was the extent of Hoy's advice it was great it worked um maybe didn't get all of the consequences that trust wanted <laughs> Again, with her learning that, it seems like she is going to be traded to the dragon. Um, but maybe there's something else, again. Because, you know, I, I think it was weird, especially learning about it. Like, okay, so, this, like, you know, it's like ether stuff. They're coming from the moon, coming down here. So, it's like, does Hoyt have something in him like that? I don't feel like, like, is there something bigger there? Or, again, is it just, they were all dots that were connecting and funneling towards the act of spying, which she did. She did successfully. Uh, what else do we have? What else do we have? I guess I had already touched on Ulam. So we'll go there for a second. Um, well, no, 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 no. Actually, I have a note on Crow that I think connects real nice. Um, and I have another thing too. Oh, okay, so, um, like we said, with all this, like, either stuff, Crow is... She has, you know, she's like a host for the Verdant Ether, which is like the the vine stuff, and so that's why everyone was afraid. That that was interesting because when you were reading it earlier on, and I think Fort was the one that was like, Crow can kill everyone on this ship, every single person on this ship, and to me, when I was thinking about that, it's like, ooh, scary, right? But you know, you know, then you think about it, and you're like, there's got to be something special about crow because you know this is the way i was thinking about it where it's like if crow was just a really skilled fighter if she was just really skilled in combat or if she was a really good shot which she is you know we learned that she's an impeccable shot i wonder if that was pre or post verdant <laughs> um we see that or sorry uh you know so blah blah, blah right if that was the case, giving trust a warning about her is fair, but being like she could kill everyone on the ship, I'm like, I don't know. Like I feel like if we all rush her, I don't care how skilled you are as a fighter, you're not you know, you're not taking out fifty people, a hundred people. I don't know how many people are on the crew, but even twenty people is like a lot. Ten people is a lot at the same time. You know, so there's got to be something special about her. So it be so, uh, you know, I was finding out that she is like a host for this, you know, it's like moon parasite that, that gives her seeming immortality or at least close to like immortality. And also, uh, you know, just like not being able to be killed, not just living forever, but, you know, um, made a lot of sense, made a lot of sense. Uh, we also connect to why she's drinking water. I remember that being a thing where it's like, she has this flask, and at first you're like, oh, flask equal alcohol, makes sense, right, that's, the, you know, that stereotype with, with pirates, they're all, you know, they're always drunk, but then, you know, there was a moment where, I think it was Tress, that was like, but it looks like she's drinking water, like, does she just, like, not trust, like, having it shared, like, she just, you know, she has her own, you know, which is fair, you know, it's, it's very fair to keep your own, your own water bottle or something, but now we know, it's like, oh, she needs water, and it seems like it's getting worse and worse, then we go to like Ulam, who was like, usually people only, you know, are able to host for up to like a year, but it seems like she's had a lot longer, but I can't see her living for much longer. So she, you know, seems like she is getting desperate, which I think is why she's doing this whole like dead runner stuff. Cause it's like, we need, I need to do this now, you know, maybe six months ago, she would have been a little more lenient, trying to find different ways, trying to find softer ways, um, but now I think she probably knows that her time is coming to a close and she needs to cure this now. Um, another quick thing, I sort of missed it when I was talking about Hoyd 
But uh, I think all in all, Hoyt is very interesting. I talked about him last part. Turns out he was much more important than I initially thought he was going to be in this book. Um, giving a lot of useful tidbits of information here and there to point Tress in the right direction. Um, again, it is very hard. Okay, so just to recap, um, I have not read this book before. Um, but I have read all the other books in Brandon Sanderson's Cosmere Universe, which is his shared universe, uh, which all of his books, not all of them, he does make books that don't fall under it, but uh, many, many, many books of his that he writes, they all fall under the same universe, even if they're separate series. Um, and Hoyd is a common character, meaning that he uh, shows up in many books, sometimes under different names. Um, so it's very hard for me to kind of, I want to talk about him, but also like, I don't want to spoil stuff, but it's also weird because like, I can't really spoil anything about Hoyd because if you know about Hoyd, like, there's a couple things I could say that would be huge spoilers, but for the most part, he's just a guy who just like tells stories to a bunch of people, usually the main character or one of the main characters. And they are kind of like this where they do give like cryptic advice that once you figure it out, it's like, oh, that was great, that helped me, but, like, in the moment, you're like, this man is insane, this man's lost his mind, not quite as insane as Hoyt is here, you know, so some, you know, the sorceress really messed him up, it seems, um, but yeah, so strange, but just, like, you know, my whole point in saying all that is that, like, um, them talking about breaking his curse, it's like, where does this factor in now? Because previously it was like, what am I going to do? How am I going to get to the Crimson Sea? Then they get to the Midnight Sea, the Sorceress, all that stuff. Now she kind of has a plan a little bit. So it's like, do we need, like, what do we still need Hoyd for? Like, I imagine at this point it's, well, we get to the Crimson Sea. What about the Midnight Sea? Like, we might need Hoyd's help for that. Or even, like, getting to the Sorceress and figuring out what to do. Um, you know, because the sorceress maybe has put a curse on Charlie, you know, so maybe Hoyd, curse broken, would be able to help with that, um, so yeah, and also, like, him and Ulam, they, like, have a connection, which we'll get to Ulam in a second, um, so it's, like, because, like, Ulam is from, well, we'll get to Ulam now, because Ulam is apparently from another planet, like, they initially described him as a zombie, which he sort of kind of is. Um, but now he's, like, from another planet, and he seems to know a lot. Like, a lot, a lot. Um, not just the... His uh, intelligence when it comes to uh, medicine, but also just... He definitely feels like an immortal who has touched down, and he's just kind of, like having fun, and he's just like, oh, yeah, Tress, oh, 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 Tress, is, is that what you think, are you sure that's the best thing to do, like, like, he's sort of talking in a way, almost like a parent talks to a kid, where the parent is an adult, so they have a thousand times more information and more experience, and so, you know, they're trying to help their kid figure out what to do, and, um, trying to like forgive their ignorance you know because the kid just literally doesn't have the years and the experience to make the correct decision or to go about things the correct way um so i feel like if maybe ulam is like that and it seems like ulam and hoyd have some sort of connection uh, you know especially with hoyd's little notes that he gives us the reader um maybe he's also something similar like that as well or at least you know maybe just ulam has uh gifted him with some knowledge so maybe that will also help if they are able to break the curse Hoyt will be much more instrumental in this and Tress truly is not the hero you know um I can definitely see it turning into more like everyone helps out you know because her stressing the whole family thing and um you know I could see that more so than Hoyt just or it's not Hoyt Tress just goes in on her own and just wins you know um, what else do we have? Now, I, lastly, I just have a few just sort of, like, interesting things that I don't know that have any real weight. I think they're just, like, interesting little tidbits. 
um, fort, who I like very much. Fort has a little tablet thing that can help him communicate because he can't speak. He's 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 deaf at the very least. I assume that means he's also mute, which I imagine comes with the territory if you're deaf. If you're born deaf, I imagine it's very hard for you to speak um, because you don't know that speaking is even a thing because you can't hear it. Or at least I guess it's harder to comprehend, I would imagine. Um little tablet thing and it turns out that he it's it's like magic and he got it from i forget where he got it from but like i, I think maybe it's hoid the narrator i think he sort of explains that it's like from another planet or something um so yeah i just, I just thought that was interesting that he has this device that can do what it does um you know i think that's and that's something that happens whenever that happens in books and stories where it's like there's this thing and we just have it. We don't know how it works and it just works and we don't know where we got it. And, you know, you know, I think it's interesting to think about, like, what other things could be in this book, if, the, if any, that, you know, are, you know, are explained like that in a world where, you know, Brandon Sanderson has built these spores and everything and they have their different powers and and all that. It's like. Oh, there's also this other magic thing that, to them, spores are normal. But then they look at this, like, tablet thing, and it's like, what is this? You know? Um, I don't know. I, just, I, I just thought that was fun. I don't know if they'll ever find the, like, the magic behind it. Like, how it actually works. If it's actually even important. Um, at the very least, I think it's just a fun thing to have in the world. Uh, speaking of spores, just to confirm, we got 12 spores, 12 Cs. Um, that is something that I think I talked about. Did I mention this last week? Or did I just think this? <laughs> um, but I was thinking about, like, I wonder if the spores do different things. Now we know, because we have the, the, like, rosite, which we see very early on. Um, oh yeah, I guess I must have talked about it because, because we had rosite last week. Um, right? Yeah, 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 we had Rosite last week, so I was like, oh, I wonder if all the different seeds, they all do different things, and I, and I, you know, I wonder if we're going to see all of them, or if it is just a fun world-building thing to know that there are 12 seeds, and each seed's spores have a different effect. Um, it seems growing is the common theme. Uh, maybe even now we've seen three of them, right? Like Verdant is the vines and the spore and the, the branch, vine branch thing. Uh, we have the rose, is it the rose sea? I don't know. Uh, the rosette, which is more like crystalline type stuff. And then we have the midnight spores, which are these like blobby things that can shape shift. Um, yeah, I think that's what they said, right? That there are some things that are a little different because the rosette and the verdant are pretty similar. Um, but yeah, I think like midnight and crimson are like the most dangerous, you know, I think that's what, uh, Either Ulam or Front. Front? What's his name? Fort. <laughs> uh, you know, Fort said. Uh, Fort, Fort's also really cool, too. I wonder if he's going to get, like, a a really big role in this last part. Because, I don't know, even them just kind of subtly building up his character. Again, with him having the, like, magic tablet thing. Um, with him saying that he's seen 12 of the, tw or sorry, 10 of the 12 C's, which is kind of crazy, kind of unheard of. Um, you know, I wonder if he's going to have like a bigger role in all this. Uh, and then finally, last thing I have, uh, again, just, you know, just a fun little interesting tidbit here. Uh, I thought it was cool how they explained how different tools affect the spores you know maybe the rosa in particular but i would think it would go towards the other spores as well maybe not i could be wrong we haven't seen that but um how they had like the, the like iron thing it pulls the crystals towards it and then we had the like steel tool which pushed the crystals away from it um it definitely explained how you can have any sort of precision as a sprouter um 
Because, yeah, I mean, if you, you know, normally when you put water on, they just kind of go willy nilly, right? But you having these tools and being able to shape them makes sense how, like, a sprouter even exists. You know, how you can even call yourself someone who has any sort of control over, you know, over these things. So uh, I thought that was fun. You know, again, I wonder if that'll have any sort of future implications if, um, you know, Tress can use that knowledge to use the spores in one way or another as a tool, just like they have been, or maybe as a weapon. Um, again, we don't know what the other spores do. There's nine other spores that we haven't seen yet. So, um, you know, maybe they're, they're something special. Uh, but yeah, that is it. That is all the notes I have. Uh, next time, like I said, we're going to finish the book. Uh, I'm going to get to predictions in a second, but uh, we're going to finish the book next time. Parts five and six. And there's also a short little epilogue as well, which is like a few pages. Um, otherwise known as chapters 35 through 64. And like I said, I think there's an epilogue. I think I remember seeing an epilogue, so we'll, we'll read that too. Um, yeah. It's also the biggest part, you know. Like I said, with the... Yeah at the very beginning of all this parts just get bigger i don't know why they did that kind of messes me up because my mind i'm like when you move stuff into parts make them all kind of even but anyway not a complaint just an observation um predictions for next time which again is the end of the book um let's see what do we think well like i said because it is the biggest part there's so much that could happen in this so much that has to happen um again there's a part of me that's like man i wonder if this is going to end happily ever after where tress finally reaches charlie and they love each other they get married all that stuff or if they you know if there is going to be a big twist at the end um i think I mean, it seems like they are skipping destroying another ship, which is nice that Tress doesn't have to deal with that, or anyone doesn't have to deal with that, you know, more more death and all that. Um, them going to the dragon, I just don't know if it's going to be that simple, you know, because that's what they said, right? Like, it's a trade, we want servants, um... I mean, I could see it being written in a way where it's like, oh, actually, Tress being the dragon servant will be to her benefit. Like, it'll get her to the sorceress easier. I don't I don't really know, though. Because um, if she gets traded to the dragon, I feel like that's it, right? Like, <laughs> you're the servant, and you have to listen to the dragon. Like, there's no way that the dragon's going to let you out of their sight, right? Serve or die, probably. Um, so she's either going to have to trick the dragon, which very much reminds me of, uh, the Hobbit. Who was the main character in the Hobbit? It wasn't Frodo, right? Frodo was in Lord of the Rings. I don't know. Bilbo Baggins? Was it, was it Bilbo? I don't know. Um, how to, like, trick the dragon, whatever. So maybe, you know, maybe that'll be somewhat there. I think she'll also have to get one over on Crow, although she, she is sort of thinking about Crow of, like, well, I mean, if Crow gets healed, then maybe all this, like, super malicious, aggressive captaining will settle. Um, you know, so maybe Crow turns out to be good. Because it would be cool. Maybe she sort of got so, like, hot-headed and violent because of her desperation with her, you know, with her situation. So, um, yeah. And we'll see, you know, there's, there's lots of wild cards, you know, Huck is a wild card to see how much information he actually has, um, you know, Hoyd, what he'll do, like I said, Fort, Soleil, and, you know, you know, kind of how they'll play, you know, what, you know, what roles they'll have in all this, um, yeah, and then also the spores, you know, you're gonna use the midnight spores again, are there other types of spores, like I said, maybe using spores as more than tools, more so as weapons, is that even a thing that can that can be done? Um, and then seeing if Dress will actually be a hero. Because it seems like she's setting up to be one, but also not be one at the same time. Um, but yeah, that is it. That is it. So like I said, until next time, uh, finish the book. I think that's what we're doing. Um, 
And yeah, I guess that's it. So finish the book. See you next week. We will see what Tress does to get out of all this. Hopefully everything ends happy for her. She beats the dragon, if that's even a thing. I mean, Hoyt did kind of tease that she's going to fight a dragon. So uh, beats the dragon, beats Crow, beats the sorceress, which we, you know, it's like <laughs> every step seems to get exponentially more difficult and more crazy. Uh, but we'll see if Tress can get to Charlie and be the hero.